to the Daily Office Lectionary. I'm Father Reed. This week, we are going to look at Proper 24. Proper 24. Now, for those of you that were with me last week, Proper 23, I explained that there are 29 propers. It actually does have an ending. And the ending is tied into, believe it or not, Easter. Because after Easter is Pentecost, and there's seven weeks. 50th day, Pentecost. We celebrate Pentecost. The next week, we celebrate Trinity Sunday. And we begin the Sundays after Pentecost, with the first Sunday after Pentecost being Trinity Sunday. And that starts the proper, the proper numbering, okay? In proper 29, we will celebrate Christ the King Sunday. Christ is King. And then we celebrate four weeks in Advent, followed by Christmas, followed by Epiphany, and we're on we go. So we are in proper 24. Now, also last week I told you that at the end of proper 23, if you recall in the listing of the scriptures, that that E-C-C-L-U-S period is Ecclesiasticus, and that is in the Apocrypha. I don't make comment on the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is good to read. It's about 12 or 13 books in the Old Testament. The Roman Catholic Church, for example, has accepted the Apocrypha as Scripture, but the Anglican Church has not. But we do regard the Apocrypha as good and important reading. We just don't say that it's the Word of God. So as you'll see this week, You'll see Ecclesiasticus 4, 1 through 10 through 15, 9 through 20. So, again, I recommend you reading it, but I'm not going to comment it in terms of Scripture, in terms of God speaking. Okay. Now, you'll notice we are starting the book of Revelation. We ended the book of Acts, and Acts has 28 chapters. It's the journey of mostly Paul, but also Peter and others, after Jesus had risen from the dead and had ascended into heaven. And we find that in Acts chapter 1. The Holy Spirit comes down upon them in Acts chapter 2, and they go out and they share the gospel with the Jews first and then the Gentiles. Now we are going to have three and a half weeks with the book of Revelation. Now we're not starting in Revelation 1. You can see that we're starting in Revelation 7. So this week we've got Revelation 7, 8, 9, and 10. And then, of course, we'll continue our journey with Jesus in Luke. All right, you ready? Revelation 7, verse 1. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of God. Now, the last book of the Bible is called the book of Revelation. And Revelation, the Greek word is apocalypsis. And that is uh, concerning, means, apocalypsis means a revealing. All right? And in order for you and me to know the scriptures and understand the scriptures, We need revelation. I like to say that we need grace, which leads to revelation, that is the opening of our hearts and minds to understanding what that word is and understanding what God is saying. So I always ask and pray for God to give you and me grace to read the scriptures and study the scriptures and have our minds open to the scriptures and then revelation. So the book of Revelation is, as you know, fairly difficult. It is an apocalyptic language. It is language that we are not used to. And therefore, it is difficult to um, figure out what he is saying. To exegete would be the fancy theological word. To figure out what the text is saying. And that's why there's so many people have so many different views of Revelation and come up with many interpretations. Now, what I want to do in the next three and a half weeks in talking about Revelation is I want to pick the, the obvious important theological ideas that I would like you to get out of this. I am not going to give you a detailed explanation of Revelation and the different nuances in the scriptures, okay? 
After this, verse 9, I looked and there was before me a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. The Lamb is Jesus. So he is alive. There, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and crying out, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So when we go to heaven, by the grace of God and our confession of Christ as Lord and Savior, we are going to enter into this extraordinary opportunity to worship the Lord and to worship the Lamb. And the angels were standing around the throne, chapter 7, verse 11, and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fall down on their faces and they worship God. The worship of the Lord is very, very important in this life. And in the next life, it's very, very important. We'll be doing lots of worship. Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Look at verse 17. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. Does that ring any bells? The good shepherd, Psalm 23. The shepherds of Israel in Ezekiel 34. The good shepherd in John chapter 10. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And so in chapter 7, we have these wonderful verses about the lamb in the center of the throne. And he's dealing with those who are suffering persecution, that God is going to wipe away our tears. And for those of us that suffer and are persecuted for the Lord's sake, the Lord will provide for us. In chapter 8, we have the seventh seal and the golden censer, silence in heaven, verse 1, for about half an hour when he opened the seventh seal very important. The seven angels who stand before God and to them were given seven trumpets. The number seven is a, is a very important number in a Revelation, a, a number of completeness, uh, wholeness. Uh, a, a fan, the, the world was made in seven days, uh, and so seven has a very, very important context in the scriptures. The trumpets, the third angel, the fourth angel in verse 12, and verse 13, as I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in the midair call out in a loud voice, Woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast that are to be sounded by the other three angels. So something is going on here that's quite extraordinary. And as we go into chapter 9, we talk about the fifth angel. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, verse 2 of chapter 9, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened by the smoke from the abyss. So, really, I, actually terrifying, right? And out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. We saw the seal of God on their foreheads in chapter 8. These were the persons that God had set apart. You want that seal. They were not given the power to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. So, something crazy is going on here, very apocalyptic, very dangerous, and has to do with God enacting judgment. Chapter 9, verse 12, the first woe is past, two other woes to come. Remember, uh, if you recall, in Luke's gospel, he talks about woes. Now, that's in context with the Sermon on the Mount, where he talks about blessed being blessed, but then Luke adds the idea of being cursed. We see that in Deuteronomy 28, by the way. So, when there are woes, something good is not to happen, okay? Then he has the horses and the riders he sees in a vision in verse 17. Um, and the, the breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow as sulfur. The heads of the horses resembled the heads of lions. Out of their mouths came fire smoke. So, uh, and then he says, a third of mankind was fail, killed by the three plagues of fire smoke and sulfur that came out of their mouths. The rest of mankind were not killed by these plagues, still did not repent of the work of their hands. Now, there's the key thing. Say, what does all this mean? I don't know. I don't know if anybody knows, really, to be honest. You'd have to do some extraordinarily serious study of this to get this right. But I do know this, that we are called to repent. And God does not, in verse 20, support worshiping demons. We shouldn't be doing those. We shouldn't be worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood. And he's been talking about idols since Genesis. Idols that cannot see or hear or walk. I'm thinking of Isaiah. 
nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. So what he's saying is there's going to be serious travail for those people who do not repent of their sins and are going to bring upon themselves the wrath of God, which is going to be horrific. And all of us that are listening to this need to have a heart toward God that is one of repentance and sorrow for one's sins, obviously the acknowledgement of that, and then the rebuke of worshiping demons and idols of gold, silver, bronze, or wood. Now, again, what that actually means in the context of what the writer is saying, John, in chapter 9, I don't know. But I do know that I know what God supports and what he doesn't support. And that's the main message. So we don't want to miss that part of it when we're reading these hard chapters in the middle of Revelation. Well, let's see what chapter 10 says. 1 through 11. I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he gave a loud shout with a roar, like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. I don't know what the seven thunders are. And the seventh, when they spoke, the seven thunders, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. And so he goes through this he goes through this process. Look at verse 8. Then the voice that I heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the land. So I went, I went to the angel and I asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. This is John. I will turn your stomach, it will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. So I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach stomach turned sour. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many nations, peoples, languages, and kings. Now, there are many scholars that study these passages and commentate on them and give us what they think their interpretation is. God is obviously doing something significant here, and his word is very important. And when these people that know the Lord prophesy about many nations, peoples, languages, and kings. That's what we need to listen to. This is why it's so important for you and me to read the scriptures on a regular basis. This is why I'm so grateful that you are joining me on a weekly basis to look at these scriptures, for me to encourage you to read them. Because when you look at the last book, the book of Revelation, you see how important it is that we live. You see how important it is who Jesus is. And he is exalted and he is glorified. And he is on the throne, and he's got a throne, and he's in the center of the throne, as we said earlier. And so you want to have that relationship with him in terms of being prepared and ready for the time where you will meet him face to face. Well, next week, proper 25, we will pick up in chapter 11. Let's look at Luke chapter 9, where I left off last week. Luke chapter 9. And let's look at the cost of following Jesus. The person says, verse 57, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. And the man said, well, first let me go bury my father. Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Wow. Still another man said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, this is a strong verse, 62. No one who puts his hand or her hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. We've got to go forward, people. We've got to go forward in what Jesus tells us to do. You can't go back to where you were and follow God at the same time. You can't go back into the world. You can't go back and do what you want to do. You and I need to do what God calls us to do, what Jesus calls us to do. So service toward him is absolute, all right? It is very, very important. As we said last week, we asked the question, who do you say that I am? Well, some say this, some say that. But in the end, he looks at us straight in the face and says, who do you say that I am? And then he tells him that he's going to die. 
and on the third day he'll be raised. And he calls us to lay down our lives for him and to follow him and that we're going to take up our cross. And it's not going to be easy, but he's going to be with us. It's going to, he's going to be with us. And so he has strong words in the cost of following Jesus. There is a cost. There is a sacrifice. But the upside, the positive reward, the blessing of following Christ far outweighs the sacrifice. Chapter 10. Remember when I was talking about Jesus sending disciples out? Now he's going to send out 72. He was just sending out the 12. Now he's sending out 72. He sends them out two by two. He tells him in verse 2 of chapter 10, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. There's always a greater harvest than the number of people that do it. The number of people that don't know Christ, that are not saved, that are not following Christ is stupendously high. It's an extraordinarily high number of people. So evangelism is very important in the kingdom of God. The way you and I serve the Lord and who we speak to and who we share with the gospel with or not share has tremendous implications. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. Go! I'm sending you. I'm sending you like lambs among wolves. And he tells us how he wants us to do this. He says in verse 9, heal the sick and say the kingdom of God is near you. Now, people need to hear the message. This is why I'm very grateful for this um, podcast, this sharing with you, this video of sharing the daily lectionary with you week after week after week after week because it's important to put the word of God in people's hands. It's important to encourage you and to pray for you and to say some words that might be helpful to you as you read the scriptures. And then God sends you out. And he sends you out to minister in his name. But you can't minister if you don't know anything. If you don't know what the scriptures say. Or if you're not reading the scriptures. Or you're not listening to the Holy Spirit. Or you're not praying. It's important also to attend a very good church and be part of the body of Christ, I might add. And I hope that you're doing that. So you want to be part of the body of Christ. You want to be a man or, and, or woman of prayer. A man or woman of prayer and of the study of the scriptures. And I'm so glad again that you're joining us. He says in verse 18, I've get, 19, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing can harm you. Remember I talked last week about authority and power? Do not rejoice, however, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. That's the key thing. Your name is written in heaven. You know the Lord. You know Christ. That's the key thing. Miracles happening to you, miracles happening through you, you're sharing the word of the Lord and people responding to you. That's nice. That's good. Christ is doing that work. The key thing is that we know Christ and then we follow him and then we submit to him and then we do what he says. And then when we do what he says, other people get blessed in the process. And I hope that's true for all of us. Now, I love verse 22 of chapter 10. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and to, to those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Remember I talked about revelation? That all of us would have the revelation of Christ, that we would have him reveal himself to us. Well, we continue on in chapter 10, and we have the parable of Good Samaritan. I don't have to tell you what that means, but it's an important scripture. The, the expert in the law says, Teacher, what's, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What's written in your law? How do you read it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. There it is. Jesus said, Do this and you will live. Love God, love your neighbor. Do this and you will live. Can't get simpler than that. But the guy said, uh, Who's my neighbor? <laughs> okay, I'll tell you who your neighbor is. And he tells this extraordinary story that is... Um, it's resounded through 21 centuries, and it will just keep on going. The parable of the Good Samaritan, and I pray that all of us are Good Samaritans. He goes to the home of Martha and Mary. Mary's worried about cooking for Jesus and making sure everything's good. Uh, Martha is, and Mary wants to sit and listen. And Martha finally says, Lord, don't you care that my sister's left to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Does the Bible say, Mary... Go help your sister. 
He says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. It's astounding. You could meditate on that the rest of your life. Martha, you're worried about a lot of things. But there's only one thing you really need to be worried about. You need to sit and listen to me talk. So what did I just get finished saying? Your time of prayer, your time of being in church and worshiping, your time of serving others, your time of listening to the scriptures, one thing is needed. Listen to what Jesus tells you. Listen to what he tells you and do what he tells you. Mary has chosen the better thing. What a beautiful scripture. And finally, in chapter 11, we have the Lord teaching us to pray. We have the Lord's Prayer. I mean, you could talk about the Lord's Prayer for hours and hours. Very important prayer. Again, back to prayer, the importance of prayer. And he says, suppose, uh, verse 5, one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says, friend, let me three loaves of bread because a friend of my journey Uh, on my journey uh, has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And then he says, well, don't bother me. The door is locked. But then he's persistent. And so we want to be persistent in our prayers, brothers and sisters. And so he says very famously, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. Everyone who asks, receive. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will it give him a snake? No, nobody. Or if he asks for an egg, will it give him a scorpion? No, that's not going to happen either. So then he says quite brilliantly, if you then, though you are evil, and there's no question that's true, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You people, us, we, me, you, are evil, and you bless How much more, if you ask me to bless you, are you going to be blessed? So prayer is about this, again, this dynamic relationship with Christ, this ongoing daily relationship with Christ. And you want to establish and be in that relationship because the value of it is immeasurable. But you have to have revelation to see that so you can see who Christ is and what he offers you. Well, I pray as you read these incredible chapters from Revelation, quite profound and sometimes mysterious and impossible to understand. And this, these series of texts from Luke chapter 9 and 10, Jesus sending them out two by two, the 72, the good Samaritan, and his wonderful teaching on prayer, that the Lord would bless you this week in your study, in your contemplation in your prayer about the scriptures from this week of Proper 24. God bless you and have a wonderful week of study and preparation. We'll see you next week for the Daily Lectionary.